Well, good morning and welcome to everyone to the 22nd meeting of the Economy, Jobs and Fair Work Committee for 2018. May I ask everyone to turn electrical devices to silent or off? And the first item on the agenda is a decision by the committee to take items 4, 5 and 6 in private. Are we agreed on that? Thank you. And item two is a decision by the committee that consideration of a draft report on the impact of bank closures and also the committee's approach to the publicly owned energy company inquiry and its work program should be taken in private at future meetings. Are we all agreed on that? Yes. Thank you. Now, today we have, uh, as our witnesses in our inquiry on the impact of bank closures, first of all, Carol Anderson, um, who is the Scotland branch and business banking distribution director of TSB Bank. So welcome to you. Good morning. And uh, Gavin Opperman, who's the Group Director of Customer Banking for the Clydesdale Bank. Good morning. Morning, thank you, Chip. Susan Allen, Head of Customer Interactions for Santander. Welcome. Good morning. Uh, Simon Watson, who's Managing Director of Personal Banking for the Royal Bank of Scotland and Ulster Bank Northern Ireland. Good morning. And finally, but not least, Robin Bullock, who is Managing Director of Lloyds Bank and Bank of Scotland Retail for the Lloyds Banking Group. So, good morning to you as well. Good morning. Um, now, I think you're aware of why you're here and what the inquiry is about. So, I wanted to start with uh, a question, which is the following. What coordination is there between banks when bank branch closures are being considered or being carried out? Um, what considerations are given to uh, the other banking provision in an area? To start with that, at TSB it's very much a local decision. So we'll look at what is available for our customers, how our customers are using our branches, and what other access to banking there is in the local community. So it's very much led by our customer behaviour, how and when they're using our branches, but also what are we going to leave behind if we do come out of that area. So we would look at whether there was another bank present, we would look at whether there was a post office, and we would also go and have a look at what the ATM facilities were like, particularly free-to-use ATMs, and whether they're available 24-7 inside or outside of buildings. We'd also look at where the nearest branch was going to be and what the public transport would look like. And then we would reach out to anybody that we felt was vulnerable and help them with access to banking through doing either digital classes with them, where we can upskill them on what's available there, or how they can access their banking in a way that they need to to get cash if they're vulnerable in terms of they're a, a cash user. And, and what coordination is there with other banks? Because if you look at what other branches are open or available, often what uh, seems to happen is one branch closes in a village or town and then all the others follow suit. So uh, I suppose the key point of my question is what coordination is there between banks? And is your answer to that um, none? in the sense of you coordinating or discussing with other banks what banking provision and availability there will be? Yeah, from a TSB perspective, ours is a local decision based on our local branch and our local customers. Other panel members, is it equally the case that you would not um, coordinate in any way with other banks' branch closures? I think, as Carol said, we, uh, I think each of us would answer quite in a similar way in terms of how the decisions are made and the, th the factors we take into account, and I think Carol summarised those really well. So we do look at the provision of banking in the local geography, and um, we would look at, at, at the other branches there, but actually our decision is not different depending on whether there are more or fewer other banks there. What we're looking at is what's the provision of banking services for that community. And often that's through the post office. So in Santander, we've had a really long relationship with the post office. We, um, we, our customers put through about 20% of their financial services transactions. It's a really important part of our provision, and we work really closely with the local post offices to make sure that we have continued services for our customers. But the decisions on which branches are, are closing are, are commercial decisions that the banks would take separately and independently, but each bank will be taking account of their own customers and how they continue to serve those customers in that community. 
So is your answer you would try to coordinate with the post office, but not necessarily with other other banks? I think as, as Susan said, I think the we look at all of the range of alternative banking provision within a, a, a given community, uh, including whether there's a post office and um, you know the post office ability to serve those customers. So I think you'll find uh, from the answers across all the banks we look at, you know, as much as we possibly can in terms of what the provision is and any additional provision that we feel we might individually like to put in uh, if a branch were to close. I think I would like to stress that we are commercial arrangement is with the post office. So absolutely the post office is one of the primary factors in terms of establishing alternatives to the branch uh, if, if we are choosing to close it. Uh, and there are no discussions with competitors around the provision of services in a local area. And Gavin Opperman, would that be the same for yourselves? Chair, we don't uh, have an industry forum or forum where we get together and discuss branch closures. We as banks individually look at the commercials behind it. Second to that, we also firstly look at the customers and what is the alternative path for the customer. And we would look at our own branch infrastructure to see which is a closer outlet to be able to service that customer base. That would be uh, our first point. Secondly, as already said by the different uh, invitees, is the fact we would look at uh, areas like the post office, ATMs, and digital capabilities to support these customers. Right, we'll come now to questions from John Mason. Okay, th thanks, Convener. Well, I mean, continuing the line that the Convener was taking, I mean, it certainly appears that some branches are very busy. I had uh, an RBS in my own constituency in Shettleston, which always had a queue in it, and it was closed. And you hear that kind of story quite a lot. So, I mean, there does appear to be demand, eh, but the banks are still closing branches. C can you explain that to me? What I would say is if you, over the last five years, the demand for uh, or, or the usage of branches has roughly halved, but the, the physical ways to bank, certainly with RBS, have tripled. So the addition of the post office, the, uh, the, the growth and the use in mobile banks, um, the role of the community banker, which we've introduced, which even when a branch might close in the community, we leave somebody there that's able to serve the local community is a way of offsetting that. So even though branch usage has almost halved, the ways to bank have tripled. And so it might appear that there is that certain branches are very busy at certain points, but in aggregate, I don't think we can ignore the overall trend um, that's, that's now very obvious in, in that you know, branch usage continues to fall at a rate that probably outstripped uh, even our most, uh, even our sort of largest expectations of what would happen uh, in the last five years. And, and would you publish the figures for an individual branch so that, say, five years ago, a thousand people used it in a week and now it's only a hundred? Because I think if people had that kind of figure, they would understand what was happening. Do you ever publish these figures? We publish the impact assessment of, of when, it, when individual branches close. I think um, over time, the, the number of branches in, any, in, in Scotland in any given market from, from all of the banks obviously has an impact on individual branch usage. So um, some branches, customers are referred to other branches, um, and it's unfortunate that you know, some of those will have closed. So we've tried to give clarity now on the network that we've got, and we've given a commitment to not review the branches in Scotland to 2020, and the usage of those uh, branches that we are closing is all public and, and in the public domain. So the actual footfall, if that's the word that you use? Well, we measure all transactions that go through a branch uh, for every customer, and also whether that customer uses that branch or another branch. So uh, in terms of what the banks, you know, what we publish in line with other banks is you know, all the customer activity that goes in and out of that branch that we can measure. Thank you. Would any others like to comment on why busy branches are closing? Well, I, I would just say, I mean, we look very carefully at every decision before we would make a decision to close a branch. And I think every one of us here would say that the aim decision to close a branch is taken really seriously. And we do understand that it has an impact on the customers who use the branch. But we look very carefully at all of the different alternatives. And when we look at branch usage over the last few years, as Simon said, we've seen footfall drop. But also, there's there's a real distinction between so, um, the transactional activity and then also the advice, which we think is really important. And a lot of customers, um, despite telephone banking and internet banking, they do want to come and speak to somebody for advice, which might be something that only happens a few times in, in, a, in a year or over a few years. But we still want good quality face-to-face -face advice. So we've taken the decision to make sure that 
branches remain a really important part of the way we serve customers. But we're having slightly fewer branches, but, but more and larger branches that have bring together all the specialists that can support customers, whether they want to talk about life insurance or investments or their, their mortgages. And day-to-day -day transactions are, are declining, not just um, because of internet banking, but also use of debit cards. The report out this week, I think, said that debit cards are overtaking cash now in the UK. And you know, debit card usage is, is easy for customers. So there are lots of technologies that have come in in the last few years that make life a lot easier for customers. And that then has impacted the sort of support that's needed in the branches. A lot of the transactions, most of our transactions, in fact, can be done really well um, through the post offices. So we're providing support for transactions locally and then support for advice in some of the slightly larger branches, as well as, of course, um, through telephone banking, uh, on the, uh, through video and uh, available on the internet. So lots of different ways to support customers. Some of my colleagues will come on to like post office and alternative ways of banking. I specifically wanted to focus. I mean, I've, I've read some of your submissions are you all measuring footfall and usage of your branches in the same way? Or maybe you don't know how each other measure it, so that's maybe an unfair question. But, I mean, we, we got a little bit of confusion, I think, before, because the suggestion was only, like, customers of your bank would be counted using a branch, whereas, for example, I would go in and pay money into a... Well, Santander was a previous one, where I paid money in for somebody who was, had an account with Santander, but I didn't myself have an account with Santander, so I don't know if that was counted or that wasn't counted. Is there a consistent way of counting footfall and usage and all these things? I wouldn't be able to comment on the other banks' approaches, but I would say for us, we count all of the transactions in the branch, so it would be all of the transactions over the branch counter. And just in Scotland, they've dropped 10% year on year. Um, more materially over over a few years. So we look at every transaction. Then we will also look at regular users just so that we can know who's how often people are coming in and making sure we've got the right services for them. Roughly, um, in, I would say about 50% of um, customers who use a, a particular branch also use another branch. So we look at that as a metric. We also look at what proportion of customers also use other channels, and typically that's about 90% in terms of ATM, po post office, uh, online or mobile. Okay, thanks. I mean, can the others confirm that you do include every transaction that's happening and it's not just the customers in that branch? Is, is, is that the case? Yeah, all transactions. Yeah, everyone's confirming that, right. Okay. And, um, I, I mean, the other suggestion that's been made to us is that you said there that usage is falling 10% a year, whereas the branches appear to be falling by more than that. Um, you know, the chicken and the egg, is it because fewer customers are using branches and therefore you're closing branches, or is it because you want more customers to go onto the digital side and you are forcing that by closing branches? There's, there's many things happening here. I mean, there are certain branches where footfall, <coughs> excuse me, is declining more than that, and there are other branches that are st sustaining a really good footfall. And I think we saw in Professor Griggs' report with the um, large shopping centres, a lot of customers, when they're going to work or going to shop, will use branches near those outlets, and that is having an impact as well. So therefore, we will invest in those branches where customers are choosing to use us more, and they will travel to, and like Susan says, those customers will appear over several branches and will show that they transact in more than one branch. Are you saying you would follow where the shops were? We'll follow where the customers are. We will be customer-driven. Right. Would you take into account the fact that uh, a shop near a bank that closes will also close because it loses its customers? I think, again, um, I don't think the bank comes out unless there is a wider economic thing going on in that high street. It doesn't tend to be the bank that's caused it. It's part of what is happening in that high street. And again, the same we would do with retail customers, we would look at what provisions are there and how we could help that business do their banking, again, through some of the post offices or other alternative arrangements. Would you accept that at least some of our people who have come to this committee think that because the bank closes, it is impacting very negatively on the, the whole town or the high street? I think in some of the, the reports, that, that is the opinion. Right. I don't know if anyone else would like to comment on that point. I think there's a, there is a, a, a wider and important context here that the, I mean, the, make, the, the way that the economy, the way people are behaving, the way that we are all doing things is changing 
so quickly and 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 i think we the banks collectively but i see it as certainly from as rbs we have a responsibility to make sure that we are fit for purpose to serve the economies that would that we exist in and where our customers work so if we we talk about the high street and changes on the high street there's a 40 percent reduction in the last five years in the number of cashier jobs available in scotland and a 40 percent increase in the number of technology jobs and a 30% increase in van driver jobs. These are symptoms of the fact that people are using online and mobile as their sort of primary means of doing things. Our job, as well as keeping pace with that, I think, is to make sure that we ensure no one's left behind, which is why we look at what are the alternative and other ways of banking so that people can continue to you know, meet their everyday banking needs if they choose to do it face-to-face -face in their local community. So I think there is a much bigger shift going on. I think that you know, the way that what you're seeing on the high street is, is really a symptom of a bigger shift in, in, in the way that, that we're all doing things every day, and that plays through into the way the economy is shaping. OK, thanks. I think other colleagues will explore that further. Thanks very much. We'll come on <coughs> to Colin Beattie. Um, banking is very much a service industry, and many of our witnesses felt that uh, the banks hadn't looked at enough alternative options around the branch closures. For example, downsizing branches, sharing premises perhaps with other banks, uh, opening alternate days of the week. There was all sorts of uh, proposals floated, but that doesn't seem to be happening. Why not? Well, we do, when, we, when we look at a branch, we look at the usage, we look at all the different alternatives available in that community, as, as Carol outlined earlier, including things like a you know, Link ATM and Post Office. For us, actually, the Post Office is able to provide a really, really good service for our customers. And we've worked with them for many years, so actually that transactional banking can be done in the local community, which we see is very, very important. Um, I mean, in some cases, when we've closed our, our branches, um, I know the closures this year, one branch has got a post office 66 feet away. So we, we absolutely look at how close is the post office to the branch and can that provide that service to the customers. One thing we also know is very important is customers knowing the people who come in and often our customers who come to our branches are, are regular customers and they are very they, they build a real connection with the people they meet every day when they come into the branch or every week or every month and so one of the things we work really hard to do is to move our colleagues from the affected branch into another local branch so that the customer has a friendly face when they come in and we've managed to do this really well over the last few years in Scotland and actually out of the closures we've done since 2013 only three people have been um, displaced and that was because they, they wished to leave the organisation. So actually we, we work hard to make sure that customers have a friendly face when they come to the other nearby Santander branch, but the banking can be done locally in the post office um, with minimal uh, change. That's fine, but is, is there any examples of alternative uh, uh, models or options being made use of? Uh, or is it just closure or not? I think, um, so I, I, I run 1,100 branches of Lloyd's and Bank of Scotland, and there are uh, many different formats, and actually for about half the branches there are different opening hours depending on uh, times of the day or, or days in the week. Uh, I would say that part of our strategy is to try and make sure that we adapt our footprint to what we see as the, the demand from customers, and I think a couple of examples of that would be bringing in mobile branches, where we recognise we've closed branches, there are it invariably is post office provision. In fact, in Bank of Scotland, every branch that we've closed has had post office provision nearby. But we've brought in mobile branches. Uh, we do have, uh, and this is public, we have micro branches, which are largely automated, but there are colleagues there to help support with the advice activity that we were talking about earlier. So I, I think I would assert that there, uh, we do flex our proposition according to uh, the demand that we see. But mobile branches of been criticised because of the uh, lack of accessibility, uh, sometimes irregular timings. In my own constituency, I've seen mobile banks that were coming in for 30 minutes now come in for 15. Uh, you know, the time slots are very narrow. And uh, there's questions of security and so on. If you're a s small business or someone dep trying to deposit cash and so forth. So they're very much, in my opinion, second class alternatives. Are there other options that have been tried? Because so far it seems to be the post office and the mobile banks. If I could, I think on the, on certainly on the, on the mobile banks, um, you know, the Royal Bank of Scotland has been serving communities with mobile banks for over 72 years. Many of them never had a branch. It is, 
something that we, our customers like. Some of the stops are for five minutes because we stop at the homes of individuals and we stop to meet with individual businesses. Um, so, I mean, the entire timetable is built around us listening to what our customers want in, um, in, in, you know, in parts of Scotland that would otherwise be hard to serve. So, I think, you know, I think that's one aspect of uh, how banking has flexed over time, and that's over many decades, to ensure that we can serve, um, you know, serve Scotland. In addition to that, I would say we've also added more bankers on the phone. So we now have a team of senior personal bankers on the phone that can speak to you well outside of branch hours. We've got video banking. We've got a banker on a plane that serves three islands uh, in, in the Northern Isles. So the, 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 the kind of breadth of provision, I think, and the flex that we've tried to introduce, I think is there. You know, is, is, I think that's there. What I would also say is that even five years ago, the way in which you can do your everyday banking now, there are so many more options than was the case five years ago, excluding digital. So if you want a physical service point, it is there are way, way more ways to do your banking in Scotland, uh, through certainly through uh, Royal Bank, than there was even a few years ago. So it's not branch closure or, or nothing. It's not closure or van or nothing else, I would say. I would add is, I mean, we have a, a footprint in Scotland where over 25% of my branches have flexible hours. So we have tried to tailor um, what we offer to the customer. So we have branches, for example, in Afford and Aboyne, which are both open half a week each so that we can remain in that community and serve the customers. And we continue to look at that. But again, it is led by customer behaviour and demand. And we will try our best to, to keep tailoring that provision. There doesn't seem to be a lot of innovation in closure of branches, but let me focus on one particular issue. Uh, small businesses say that about 85% of their transactions are in cash. Now, they obviously have a need to access banking services. In 2016, 44% of the 15.4 billion consumer payments were made in cash. Now, small businesses by the nature of their business, they need to be able to deposit their cash. They're now faced with post offices seem to be somewhat inadequate as regards that, because there's all sorts of arrangements in advance you've got to make if it's more than £2,000 and all that sort of thing. They have to travel quite a distance to deposit their money. I won't use the apocryphal tale from the Royal Bank closing down in the aisles because I think the guy has about 15 hours or something to get to his bank to deposit cash. But just in my constituency, suddenly customers, small businesses, are having to travel uh, to Musselburgh and other branches round about. I'm talking specifically in the Clydesdale here, for example, where the Dalkeith branch closed. Now, for a small business, there's maybe only you and somebody else running that retail shop, and somebody's got to vanish for an hour to go and deposit cash, that's a long time, especially if they arrive at the, ba the branch and there's a queue, which anecdotally that's what we're told happens. So the shopkeeper's faced with security risks of holding more cash in his premises for longer periods and the risk, of course, of going to deposit that cash. I mean, how are you tackling that? Do, do you recognise that small businesses have 85% of their transactions in cash? and? How are, you, how are you accommodating these people, given the limitations of the post office? Well, in fact, we're, um, Santa Dead has a long history at the post office, going back to Alliance and Leicester and the Gyro Bank, and our um, service for small businesses across the UK is that the cash is paid in at the post office, and we've worked really closely with the post office to deliver a really good service for our customers. Um, you know, obviously, every post office is different, as every branch is different, so you will get some, some different experiences, but by and large... Um, we're, we've been very satisfied with the service provided to our customers. So when we close a branch of Santander, there's absolutely no change for our small business customers because they have always paid in in the post offices and we have made arrangements for that to happen. So, so through the chair, I think we all agree that the last measure that a bank wants to do is, is close a branch. That, that, that's, that goes without saying. Where it does come into play is when one looks at it, one looks at the customers that we've got within that branch that the branch services. And looking at that part of it is looking at the small business customers more specifically. 
And the alternative measures, like my colleague has mentioned, you have the fact of that of uh, the using the post office. You've got means like Chief West that's introduced a new cash depositing capability. Cash is starting to take a different form where people will deposit their own cash in safes in their own premises. These are the kinds of innovation and they're more innovative and creative ways that people are starting to deposit and use cash. And I think the, the most important part that we play in that is making sure that the training and the education and solving for the specific customer at the point. And that is why we notify customers long in advance about closures and we get into discussions and on the small businesses we use our relationship managers to engage with the customers and have those quality discussions to see how to solve for it. Uh, if there are customers specific that haven't been solved for, you know, we encourage that we engage with them and that we have a discussion to be able to solve for their cash depositing uh, uh, shortages that they're not experiencing. That sounds fine but the evidence that we're receiving is that the banks are not responding to the needs of the small businesses, that they are, that they are having difficulties. <coughs> now, how can you alleviate that? I would say I mean, in answer, I think that the core, at the core of this, we have um, cash is now in the minority. Okay, so so it has, it is changing incredibly quickly. I think one of the things that we are have, have done and tried to do try to do uh, with our business customers is twofold. One, if there is a branch closure, uh, and again, you know, it's never easy. Um, you know, it's never an easy decision. But we give our business customers a named contact, and we give all of our personal contact uh, personal customers a named contact, and we proactively call out to them to make sure that we leave them with an arrangement which suits them. Now, we try and do that in every single circumstance, and we try and ensure that that is absolutely cost-neutral for our business customers. So they shouldn't incur any more costs as a result of that. In terms of how, business, how we can support businesses to continue to be successful, I mean, my view is that you know, a business owner wants to spend the majority of their time running their business, not you know, running to and from a bank. So we will try and work with them to find a way which means that they can, can do that in the best way possible, including, for example, giving them access to free contactless terminals so they can take so they can reduce their reliance on cash. And what we see with that is where, when businesses use less cash, their takings tend to go up in certain sectors. So it's between 7 and 10% um, uplift in their takings when they remove the, um, the when they start to take contact lists. So I think there is a, a benefit to, to business as well um, in terms of us supporting them, but we're very conscious and wouldn't want to leave anyone uh, in a situation where they can't focus on what their primary kind of goal is, which is to run their business well for their customers. But you say if they go contactless, they get extra business. A lot of these businesses are, are in uh, uh, areas that are less wealthy, and the, the, clearly that's reflected in the volume of cash transactions that are going through and the difficulties that uh, the, re, the, the small businesses are having in dealing with that. 85%, 85% is a huge figure in terms of a small business handling cash. And, you know, there is, there is this demand to safely deposit money and how are you responding to that? How are you, how are you supporting your, your consumer here? I, I've, I've heard in these committees previously an, an assertion that, that cash is dead. It, it is absolutely not dead. It is perhaps dying, and it might be dying slowly, but I understand that you have a lot of representation from small businesses who use cash, and I do not, absolutely do not dispute the figure that you've uh, come up with. I think we do believe the post office is a very good solution, and one of our main competitors uses that as a cornerstone <coughs> of their business proposition. Uh, but the post office has 1,400 outlets across Scotland, uh, arguably the biggest distribution of, of any uh, supporter of um, organisations who, who need uh, banking. And uh, the, the post office themselves talked about the level of investment that they've made in, in the post office. Uh, as I said already, we have a commercial arrangement with the post office, so there is an expectation that the post office will... Um, benefit from the arrangements they made with the banks and invest in their proposition. And also we, of course, provide uh, mobile branches in a number of locations uh, and uh, wishing to avoid repeating what's been said already. But there are alternatives such as um, cardless, there are alternatives such as courier services, and we do talk to many businesses about using courier services, and some of them find that very beneficial for the reasons that you stated around security, uh, their ability to be in the business and not having to uh, go to the local bank. So, um, you know, we consider 
our branch closures very, very carefully, but those are the factors that we use to determine alternatives for businesses uh, in, in the local area. We'll need to move on now to questions from Jamie Halker Johnson. Thank you very much. Morning to the panel. Sorry, I was a little bit late, Kavina. Um, we've heard uh, over, over the period of this inquiry from uh, a number of councils and community groups that offered space um, for banks um, where banks could operate, um, but we, they weren't aware of any instances where that had actually been taken up. I think security was one of the main reasons for that. So I was wondering if you knew of any instances where um, that kind of approach had been, um, had been used as an alternative, and if not, is it something that you may consider for your businesses? Certainly, we are act we are in discussions at the moment, and there are a number of discussions running about the use of premises. I think, if I'm interpreting your correctly, uh, your um, question correctly, which is, you know, could that, could branches be repurposed for a different use in the community, um, or is this? No, I think uh, this, this, is, this is actually, um, uh, as I say, councils and other groups providing a space for you to provide banking services uh, yeah. within their communities. Yeah, I mean, uh, we. When we created the, the role of community banker, um, we work in partnership with local communities to find where that community banker can be best housed. So that that individual role uh, may well be based in uh, it may well be based in a library, or it may well be based in uh, sometimes it's within um, uh, sheltered housing, for example. But we to serve different customer groups. So I think you know we there is evidence of us you know changing the banking model and to be able to. Um, you know, to provide services from different locations that might not be branches, for example. So, would that, would those kind of services be more advice, uh, kind of guidance. They wouldn't be banking services, such as for small businesses or for consumers. That's right. So it's, it's predominantly a, a yeah. guidance and, and support. That's correct. yeah. I mean, I think what we're looking at is actual providing, you know, deposit, um, cash, that kind of thing. Is that something that any any anybody has any kind of experiences of in I terms of? Uh, Chief, I might comment. 80 to 90 percent of the transactions that we currently do through our branches can be done through the post office. The post office has got a greater reach. To expand that into a different network, we'd rather be working as an industry with the UK finance to be able to see where uh, we can strategically work closer with the, with the post office to be able to close that gap even more than actually going and providing that. From an advisory capacity and remote sites engagement, which is non-cash related, uh, that, that continues, but when we talk specifically to cash, uh, we still use the post office and the likes of, which we expanded earlier, on the G4S. Okay. And, and I would agree with that. You know, we've, we've worked very closely with the post office, as I've already said, for a number of years, and um, we have you know, good, good uh, ways of working with them. We've invested in technology. They've invested in technology to enable them to serve our customers well. And so that, that generally is where we would go in terms of providing something locally through the 11,500 post offices across the UK. And we work, you know, when we when we make a decision, the difficult decision to close a branch, we give as much notice as possible to our customers, but we'll also work at the post office locally. And we've had lots of examples of, you know, in, in Lockerbie of the, po of the postmistress, um, Karen coming in and running some sessions in the branches. We'll, we'll uh, work with our customers, particularly our more vulnerable customers, and our branch staff will even, you know, walk with the customers to the post office to walk them through how to access the services there to make sure they're comfortable. Um, so we work really closely closely with the local post offices to make sure that the service there can be provided to the customers and to make sure the customers are comfortable with, with the service they'll be able to access. And that, that's our preferred route, as, as the Governor said. Okay. Just add, every single branch that we've closed in the last five years is within walking distance of a post office. Um, the next question I had was around this idea of, I suppose, financial hubs, and, and again, it's, a, it's a, a point that's been raised by a number of people that have given evidence to this inquiry, um, where perhaps banks, multiple banks could offer services, um, bringing them to kind of together. Now, the suggestion that we're getting from you is that actually the post office provides that role. We've heard evidence from others that the post office doesn't can't provide that because of it can take too long to put cash in, and uh, uh, we know that um, post offices can be uh, unreliable. Can be unreliable in terms of hours. Obviously, there's issues in remote and rural areas of post offices being lost as well. So, taking that into account, how would you how would you kind of answer those those issues about the whether the post office is really going to be a suitable alternative in in a lot of locations? 
Sorry, Chair, am I understanding the question correctly? Is this joint space for banks to be able to be housed? Well, yeah, I mean, that was, that was something that came up, this idea of a kind of financial hub where perhaps all the banks could utilise a shared facility. Mm -hmm. um, it sounds like that your approach would be, actually, we don't need that. The, the, the post office is, is where we intend to do, or you intend to do, uh, provide, provide service local businesses and individuals can pay money and take money out. What, what I'm then asking is, how reliable would, would you say the post offices are if, uh, to provide that service if they're not open as much, if we're losing post offices in some areas? And, and as I say, they don't have maybe the security or the cash, the cash managing facilities that a bank would have. And in terms of, I mean, I've spoken with many postmasters, and I think you have, you're right in the sense that there is um, the potential for a post, I mean, post offices are small businesses. So um, a number of the postmasters that I've spoken to, um, I mean, are in one particular conversation where I was greeted with, you know, your customers are my customers, and it gave the post office a real boost. And it, it concentrates and I think strengthens the post office network to have it as a banking hub in a local community. If we were to try to do something separate to that, obviously that trade wouldn't be going through the post office. So I think in addition to, you know, kind of making sure that our customers are well supported with any transition to using the post offices and I think rate, continuing to raise awareness of what services are available through the post office, we also make sure uh, if a branch is closing that we try and give the post office the right equipment to make that banking experience as smooth as possible for our customers. So it's not a walk across the road and leave the relationship there. We actually work with the post office to make sure that they've got the right infrastructure and they've got the right setup to handle um, you know some of the, the everyday banking inquiries and, and support from our customers that they might they might well get in the in, in the in the months following a closure. Okay. A couple of observations. I mean, we have um, roughly 20% of our customers, Lloyd's Banking Group customers, now use the post office uh, on a not infrequent basis, and that has grown by 14% in the last 12 months. So there's there's definitely a level of appeal. Uh, I, I would endorse what's been said already, which uh, it is absolutely our view, which is that the post office is a suitable alternative, uh, and uh, we're happy to work with the post office on signposting and promoting that service more, uh, as well as uh, enhancements to the proposition over time. And I, and I do, I do. You, you talked about the potential for post office closures. If we were, if we went down a different route, some sort of shared service arrangement. Uh, I think that could potentially have an impact on the post office relationship uh, and I would imagine that the relationship the banks have with the post office is uh, very attractive to them. So I think that that's something that would clearly be a, a spectre hanging over that relationship if we were to go down the shared services. Can I just ask quickly, the, the, the increase in use by your customers, is that business customers or um, that, personal that's banking? That's in the round. Our business customers have... have um, uh, had the relationship with the post office over the last 12 months. We've had the relationship with the post office for personal customers longer than that. I'm afraid I don't have the exact statistics to hand for business customers. I'm happy to provide them to the committee. Um, but th th actually, the growth in business customers will be greater because it's a very uh, it's early stages of that proposition. Can I ask, uh, 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 sorry, just, just moving slightly to, to this side. We obviously had Link in and Link provide, as you very well know, Link obviously provide ATM services. But is there any uh, a scope for, say, um, if, they're one of, if there was a last bank in town, for that bank to provide business banking services to customers out with out with their own customers, for example, um, for, a, for a fee almost along the link model for ATMs. Would that, is that something that is available? Is that something that would be considered in terms of just straightforward business banking, cash deposits and the like? Well, I think in Saturday we don't do business banking deposits in our branches anyway, so that's all through the process. So we wouldn't, yeah. I couldn't see us opening up. Well, for, for, for those that, that do, I mean, you, you know, would you take another bank's customers and deposit, the, 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 sorry, the business businesses of, uh, who operate with another bank, their uh, business deposits for a, for a fee? Or would you only exclusively uh, use, you know, use your own business customers? If the, if the customer deposited from another bank money through our bank, there would be a fee attached to it, but we'd encourage that customer to open an account with ourselves. Uh, because it would, it would <laughs> that, that, that's, that's the route we would go. Uh, and we would take that. We would take that and we'd encourage that relationship. Mm -hmm. And when that bank did the closure, they probably accounted like we would. 
they would account for the fact that there would be a certain loss of customers because their bank was closing and the next proximity might be an inconvenient to the customer and they might lose the relationship. And they took into account that there was, in fact, another bank in town. Is that a fairly standard, uh, you know, standard operation across banks that you will take deposits from other customers, but for a fee? Okay, that's interesting. Uh, we, we currently see it where um, business customers will open an account purely for that and then transfer it back to whoever they banked with, because that loyalty is there and, and they will stay with their bank, but we will accept their deposits. Right. Um, thank you. Um, I'm interested you seem to focus on the post office because some might say that the post office provides a public service and I think at the outset you talked about being private businesses or considering the, the particular economics when you close branches. So some might say, well, you should provide the service rather than the post office. Um, do you accept there's a public duty on you as banks rather than simply being private enterprises? responsibility to serve our customers well and I think we work very hard to look at the different ways we can do that and the way our customers choose to bank is, is changing you know we've seen significant growth in internet and mobile banking we take on about a thousand new mobile banking customers every day and many of them just want mobile banking so a lot of customers want to bank with us in different ways but we still have to support all of our customers so we look at uh, how we provide services through telephone through video through um, online mobile and indeed through branches and we are investing in branches and I think one point I'd like to make is that, you know, for all of us, I, I think branch banking remains a really important part of how we serve our customers. And for Santander's perspective, we've invested over the last few years some £13 million in refurbishing branches to provide those advice hubs, to provide better services uh, for customers. So we see um, the branches as a, as a very important part, and we take very seriously our responsibility to our customers. I mean, you're, you're, you're underwritten by the Financial Services Compensation Scheme, which ultimately is the UK taxpayer, as we saw in the 2008 banking crisis. So um, do you accept there is a responsibility beyond what perhaps a private enterprise might have that is not underwritten in that way? And perhaps come to Gavin Opperman. Gee, as a bank has been around over 100 years, and customers that have supported the bank and communities that have supported us and we've supported... We, we definitely look at it from a, from a bank perspective and say there's, there's a bigger and there's a wider responsibility. But that wider responsibility is not only for that geography, it's for the firm on, on across Scotland. So yes, we do take it from a, from a bank-wide perspective and say there is a responsibility that's wider. And that is why when one does go through a closure, it's a very vigorous process that one goes through because that is the responsibility that we take as a bank. banks is d dependent on and linked to the health of the communities and the economy that they serve. So it is, you know, we, we make sure and we invest in everything that we can possibly look at to make sure that we are doing the best job for the immediate customers we're serving and also for the wider communities that we serve. I mean, it is, it is when we talk about branch closures, we, I fully appreciate that, that, that our colleagues serving in branches play a much bigger role than simply taking in and handing out cash. And so when it, I think that is something that people feel that they lose. And so one of the things that, as I said, we're very keen to, um, you know, to continue to, to grow and invest is this idea of the community banker, the face of the bank in a local community that can do more than simply advise on your everyday banking, but can help keep people safe, can advise on, um, you know, whether it's keeping people safe from scams, can be part of the local community discussion about what else is going on. Because I realise that banks play that role, and it's a very important role. So it is not you know, it is certainly the case that we view our obligations and our responsibilities in the widest possible context. I, th I think I'm just going to ex expand on that point. So from a, a Lloyds Banking Group point of view, we, we have a stated commitment to help Britain prosper. Some, some of the manifestations of that are commitments around uh, lending to uh, the mid-markets and SME, our commitment to first-time buyers. We will contribute over £100 million through our foundation over the next three years. Uh, we employ 13,500 people in Scotland, so we, we look at our, our obligation to society in, uh, I think, the, the broadest possible way. Um, I, I would agree 
branches are a core part of our strategy. We have 155 locations across Scotland and we won't be closing any in 2018 and we are recruiting more to help with customer demand and be there when our customers need us most. Thank you. We'll now come to Jackie Bailey. Thank you very much, convener. Um, it, all of you in advance of your appearance here today were asked to provide the committee with information on the number of bank branches you had in 2010 and the number you have now. Can I thank Santander and TSB for providing that information, but I'm wondering, in the case of all the other three, where that information is and whether you can tell us just now um, how many bank branches you had in 2010, how many you have now, and what percentage closure that represents. Starting in no particular order, because Robin Bullock is looking at me, he's drawn the short straw. All right. Um, we had a, a moratorium, moratorium on branch closures for a number of years, um, so I, I'm happy to have this verified, but I believe the number was 293 in 2010, and the number now is 206. Uh, so that's a 30% reduction in the number of branches. Um, and I would just add that I, I think um, that probably stands up to scrutiny reasonably well. We believe we take a very measured and indeed gradual approach to branch closures uh, and have done over that time. Okay, thank you very much. Mr Watson? Uh, my I don't have the specific numbers, but to, to say that uh, it is, uh, we had a similar size network, I think, into, uh, to Bank of Scotland, and we are now at the point where we have just short of 100 branches uh, in Scotland, so that would be um, uh, quite a, a significant... I'm genuinely risk. disappointed you can't provide that uh, My detail. apologies for given that the, I, in the request. Given that the committee uh, asked for it in advance, and you are quite senior in your organisation. I completely appreciate that, and I will. Um, if I can't get that during the hearing now, I will make sure that I get that to you immediately. Afterwards. Excellent, thank you, Mr. Offerman. We had 150 branches in the beginning of 2010, and beginning of the year we have 71. So that's about a 50 percent reduction. <coughs> Correct. Okay. Okay. I wonder whether I can focus in on RBS. Sorry to pick you out. No, no, no. Um, well, good indeed, because I'm going to do it anyway. Um, it, you you said that when a bank closes, you want to leave something behind in the community. Um, let me just test that with you, because you closed the branch in Alexandria, in my constituency. At the point you closed, we were in dialogue. You said you would consider a mobile banking branch. Um, I think more than a year later, you were still considering it, despite occasional prodding from myself. Um, then you decided you weren't going to do that. During that period, for a lot of the time, the ATM wasn't working. What did you leave behind in Alexandria? So I'm aware of the, the individual circumstances of that. Um, I think that was... Um, uh, so I think we, we did make the commitment to put a mobile bank in. Uh, my understanding is that we did struggle to house that, uh, to find a location to serve from. So without going into the, yeah. with the, with the specifics of that, that's my understanding of what happened at the time. Um, in terms of the, the, the ATM provision... Uh, it's obviously we have set standards that we attempt, uh, attempt to meet and, and SLAs with the people that also provide and look after our ATMs. Um, if we've fallen short in that occasion, then I'm, I'm very sorry. Uh, I'm very happy to continue the, the discussion about Alexandria in the specifics, but I do know that we made that commitment. I'm aware it was very difficult to deliver on it uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, I'm sorry if we didn't do it as fast as we, as we should have done. Um, but in the majority of uh, all of the cases that I'm aware of now where we've been asked to look at um, additional provision or changing our, um, what, what's available to local communities, I think we've managed to, to meet that. Um, for example, in, in Juniper Green, where we were asked to respond with the addition of a mobile bank, so I know that we've managed to put in so instances like that. Um, but we are actively involved in, in many discussions, and we always try and deliver on our promises and our commitments, and if we didn't in that um, case, then I'm very sorry. I, I can only assume that you've been misinformed because the excuse of not having a location was dealt with when I found the bank a location that they could go to free of charge. But, I mean, I'll leave you to discuss that with your colleagues later on. Um, can I turn to Arika? Um, again, here's a, a... RBS was the last branch in town. You closed down, left nothing behind. Um, the community are looking for an ATM. You've refused that too. Can you explain what your contribution is to Arica, given that um, you talk about it wouldn't be a closure and then nothing? It felt like a closure and then nothing in Arica. In 
There are a number. There are there are any number of different ways in which we can support a community once we leave. Whether that's through a community banker, whether that's through working with Link, for example, and their financial inclusion fund in terms of getting a a, a subsidised ATM, or, or whether it is um, the mobile bank. So there's any number of options that we could look at. There are individual circumstances in some communities where it might take us longer to do that. But I'm not aware of where there's been anything where we've not been able to uh, provide some kind of suitable alternative uh, and I'm very happy to take up the specific case of Arica with you uh, that separately or meet anybody from the local community that would want to talk to me directly. Excellent, we shall take you up on that offer, you can be assured of that. Um, can I turn to more general points for RBS? I mean, the UK government, of course, all of us, um, own 60% of RBS, yet there isn't a seat for the UK government on the board. Can you explain that? Well, the... The holding is um, with um, UK FI, um, so that's who we we deal with uh, as the as the shareholder of the organisation, uh, and the, the board structure is something that was agreed. I think at the point at which the, um, the, the 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 finances were injected into the bank. So I don't have any any particular view on on, on board structures of our of the Royal Bank. Okay, have there been any discussions at any level in RBS with the UK government or UK FI about bank branch closures? We would we talk to all of our shareholders, so and obviously UKFI being our largest one, uh, and all of our, about the strategy of the bank and, and what we're doing. Um, so I think those discussions are uh, are constantly ongoing. So whether that's the individual private shareholders that we would have met in the last few weeks or uh, with UKFI, so it was the same discussion would happen with all of our shareholders. So they would have been aware of the programme of, of branch closures? UKFI would have been aware of the strategy of okay. the bank. I'm not aware of any, any specific discussions relating to branch closures with our shareholders because I don't have those direct discussions okay. with our shareholders. But the strategy would have outlined bank closures? No, the strategy would have outlined what the bank's plans and intentions were in the next few years to remain relevant. So I'm not aware of any specific discussions on branch closures. Okay. But there was no objection made at any stage by UKFI to branch closures? I, I have not been in any discussions with UKFI or any of our shareholders on branch closures, so I wouldn't be able to comment on that. OK, perhaps you could find out if anybody in the organisation is, because I accept you're saying you haven't personally been, um, but it would be interesting to know for the committee. I'm very purposes. happy to come back to you on that. I think that it may well have been raised in another public forum as well with our really? CEOs uh, okay. in terms of that question, so I may well... Um, uh, provide that answer as well. Fantastic, thank you. Um, and finally, um, you've said that 10 of the 62 threatened branches will remain open until the end of 2018 at least, um, whilst you conduct independent research. Can you tell us the basis of the research? Um, who's going to be doing it? Um, will you share your methodology with us? Because I think the committee would be interested in reflecting on that. So there are 10 branches um, that are uh, given for review. Um, we've made the appointment uh, of the, the independent reviewer. Um, that is now with them to satisfy themselves that they are looking at everything that they need to do and that will inform the final contract uh, and we should be in a position to announce the details of that uh, in the coming days. So. Okay, we will await that with interest. Thank you very much, convener. And Andy Whiteman. Convener, thanks to all of you for coming along this morning. Um, you, according to the, the banking um, standard, you conduct what's called an impact assessment on, on closures. Um, the committee's inquiry uh, remit is to examine the impact of bank branch closures in Scotland on local businesses, consumers and the Scottish economy. Uh, and I note, I mean, I have one of these assessments here for RBS, um, whose branch in Lilithgow is closing a week tomorrow. Um, I notice, incidentally, that only one of the regional MSPs was consulted um, by the by the bank. But the, the critical thing here is that it documents what steps have been taken by the bank to speak to their customers about the impact on customers. But there's 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 nothing really on the impact on the wider community or the local economy. Can you confirm that you do or do not do any analysis of the impact of the closure of a branch on the local economy? If, if I can um, explain the process um, that we undertake, so uh, we, we do a full review of the local area, um, which would probably ex extend, well, it most definitely does extend to uh, all of the Bank of Scotland representation in the local area. 
we look at um, bus routes between branches that we pot could potentially close and um, alternatives. We look at the provision of post office, and as I said earlier, um, every branch closure that we've undertaken over the last four years has had a post office in close proximity. We look at the provision of, of ATMs, uh, and we absolutely, we absolutely seek to understand um, how that, that microeconomy works. Um, in terms of seeking to establish the impact after we have gone, it is about uh, how our customers will be able to access their banking, uh, both in terms of the ATMs, post office, alternative Bank of Scotland branches, uh, the number of customers who use online banking, the number of customers that use telephone banking, uh, and we seek to ensure that they have adequate provision. That, that those are the areas that we look at primarily. So, yes, I understand that because that's in the impact analysis. Yeah. And that's looking at customers. That's not looking at the impact in the economy. So we've had evidence that the loss of a bank branch um, <coughs> can have a deleterious effect on other local businesses because people don't come there anymore. Footfall drops in the wider economy. But you're not look. I just this is not a criticism. Uh, but you, you you don't do any analysis of that as such. I mean, to it is certainly what we do is often when there's a closure, there's a reinvestment. So if we took a, a case of today, uh, we as a bank are closing one of our branches in Edinburgh, but we built a flagship branch in Edinburgh. So we have reinvested the money back into the community, back into the branch. I wouldn't say that in specific geographies all the time, but that reinvestment is put back in. It's not as if it's dividend that is distributed back to shareholders. It is reinvestment, which really to be able to support the communities. And often we find that some of the premises and that that we're actually housing are not no longer suitable for, for the bank. And this is where the opportunity is. So there's also a reinvestment back into the community. So if one looks at Scotland at large, I think it's fair to say that it is taken into consideration. There'll be, I mean, the, the, the circus example I'll look at is an RBS branch in Lilithgow, which is closing next week. There's no reinvestment in Lilithgow, I don't think. Um, can I ask on the 10 branches that have been, uh, are to remain open till the end of 2018, the research you're doing, um, what's the focus of that research? Does it go beyond the steps you would take in an impact assessment? Yeah, we'd look at additional circumstantial factors that, that, may, that are in and around those 10 branches. So it's up to the independent reviewer is looking at their own criteria as well over and above our decision making uh, and uh, on which they will then base their recommendation to um, keep or stick with the decisions that, were, that we made. And of the, bank, of the bank branches that have closed in the last few years where you've been uh, following the banking standard or protocol, uh, do any of you have any branches where following notification of intention to close, you have received representations for customers uh, and have subsequently decided not to proceed with the blank, with the, with the closure? Are there any examples of that? One where we've delayed a closure for six months on the on the additional information that was provided in the engagement period, but, but no other branches have remained open. Any of the others? I have one, but not in Scotland. No. So on the six months, was that just to sort of deal with particular problems that customers uh, were having? I, I am aware. I, I should be able to tell it you. It doesn't matter. Um, it was a specific circumstances in local geography uh, that uh, meant it's, it would support the local area temporarily with if we delayed the closure of our branch. I'm happy to uh, advise the committee of the detail of that. But that's just one, one, yeah. one for six months. Yeah. Um, can I move on to the actual um, premises themselves? Um, we've visited a number of towns across Scotland and had focus groups with people and we've received quite a bit of um, evidence that closed branches buildings are, are sitting there in the town or uh, unused, um, maybe the ATM is still there. What in general is your policy relating to a closed bank building? 
if I could explain the process that we go through uh, at, at RBS, which is to firstly try and ensure that we can as quickly as possible get that building into the hands of a new owner, and ideally somebody that's going to make a positive economic, economic contribution to that community. So that's the, the, the first goal. We also then open up the prospect of the community coming together, so either through charity partners or social enterprises, to see if that branch could be turned into something else of that has value to the local community. Um, I appreciate that that is often very difficult to do because bank branches are usually designed to be bank branches. So um, it doesn't. It, we wouldn't want to transfer the risk of, um, you know, adjusting that into for a different purpose onto a group without a proper without a kind of a sustainable business plan. So we also work with um, community groups to try and come up with a sustainable business plan. I would say that that is very. It's proven very difficult to do that, uh, just because of the costs involved sometimes of, uh, of alter, uh, altering bank branches. But um, we try and accommodate and work um, wherever we can to, to make sure that that gets into the, the hands of the right owners. It is sometimes the case that bank branches do remain empty for long periods of time precisely because they are quite difficult buildings to, to change for alternative purposes, I would say. You know, we, we are very conscious of the impact an empty building has in a, in a high street, and so we do work uh, on the buildings that we own. We work um, to try and get those uh, into the hands of new owners as quickly as possible, and generally it's within 12 months, which I know is still quite a period, but generally the, the owned buildings we've exited have been um, occupied again within a 12-month period. Obviously, some of the buildings we own are leased, and it might be that there's a lease, pr a lease end, so that is really one for the leaseholder, uh, and there's no involvement beyond um, us handing back the lease. So in the interest of saving time, if you do <coughs> have policies in place on that, <coughs> I could send them into the no, kit. No we've had a number of instances where we've, we've uh, in Gorebridge, we've supported the local uh, community there by providing our branch for a temporary period. It's been over 12 months now. In, in Wigtown, we know that the, there's uh, the right to buy scheme uh, is being used, and we're happy to support that. Um, as Susan has said already, a number of our branches are leased, so we're returning them to the the leaseholder, um, and then we the, the remaining branches we put up for sale. So of the branches that have closed, roughly speaking, what proportion are now either returned to leaseholders or have been sold or are now occupied and being used for something else? <clears throat> so you probably don't I'm, have I'm afraid I don't know that information. I'm, <clears throat> I'm happy for it to be submitted to the committee, but I, I don't have that detail. Because the concern I think we've had is that in some instances, bank buildings are sitting there <clears throat> excuse me, um, as an eyesore for quite long periods of time. Now, presumably, these may be isolated incidents, um, but it would be useful to get a broader picture on that, um, particularly as we're talking about communities often who are suffering broader economic downturns for which a, a closure of a bank branch is not, is not exactly um, helping. <clears throat> There were reports in the media, I, I think a year or so ago, with RBS in particular, placing restrictions on sales of banks, including a restriction that it cannot be bought or used by another financial services body. Are, are you familiar with those? Or? Not aware of that being in our current sales process, so I wouldn't... That, that's not something I recognise. I'm happy to go away and confirm if there is any aspect of maybe third-party agreements where that's the place, but I'm not aware of that. OK. <clears throat> uh, Simon, you said that in, in terms of bank closures, you you work with the community to see whether there are alternative uses that could be made. Is that a systematic thing? You do that in every case? We, offer that, we offer that discussion up in every, in every to whom, instance. To whom to, do you offer to that? Whoever, whoever we might be engaging with. There, we've been approached by a number of groups, but we also, um, through our local directors, um, who will take responsibility for managing the, the local closure program, our knowledge of what's going on in the local community. Uh, if we feel that there is either another business or if there is a community group that we should approach, then we try and be as proactive as possible in doing that. Um, we don't want to lead the witness on that, but we do make it clear that we are very open to any discussions um, and we will happily engage with, with any group uh, to look at the, the, their plans and see if we can help. It's not systematic then, it's not a, a process you couldn't, for example, <clears throat> you don't have a, a list of every closure and what process has been followed to see what community... We have a common be. process for all closure, uh, closures and as part of that process we ensure that we do engage with it and entertain and support any bids from the local community, yes. You, you um, say support we... bids, but that's different from you being proactive about it. 
I mean, if no one comes forward, that's not necessarily evidence that there couldn't be a useful use of that building. I, no, I would agree with that. So what I'm saying is our <coughs> local directors are part of and are out in the local communities along with the branch managers in the, branch ma in the branches that are closing to ensure that we are trying to make it very clear that if there is anyone that's interested or would like a discussion, then we're very happy to, uh, to do that. Okay, thank you. Uh, Gordon MacDonald. Was the RBS Malerno, there was an approach and they were told that we need to make the full market price of it. There wasn't any leeway from the bank whatsoever when Malerno was shut in a number of years ago. So, you know, I, I take what you've just said with a pinch of salt. Um, the committee's received written evidence that um, by, the end of this for, by the end of this year, 368 branches will have closed since 2015 across Scotland. Um, we're being told that mobile branches are part of the answer. Can you tell me how many mobile branch vehicles each of your organisations have based in Scotland? And if you don't have any, why not? Happy to if it's a viable that. alternative. Okay, we have, so we have, uh, Royal Bank has uh, 21 uh, mobile banks. Uh, they cover about 8,000 miles a week. Uh, and they serve 440 individual um, community stops, and we have a number of spares as well should uh, one of those vehicles go off the road. And it's all 21 based in Scotland? That's correct. Right. Anybody else? Um, uh, we have, in, in Bank of Scotland, we had five. Uh, we now have 12. Uh, the five have been around for a long time. Our first mobile branch was introduced a year or two after I was born, 1963. Um, and uh, we cover 108 different communities. Uh, the, the main service offering is uh, each of those mobile branches uh, visits a location for between one and two hours on each occasion it visits, and it tends to visit between uh, one and two times per week. Anybody else? Uh, we don't have any mobile branch, uh, branches. It is something we have considered when we look at our closures. So as we said earlier on, we, we look at the closures and look at what alternatives we have for our customers nearby. Could be another Santander branch, could be a post office. And typically because of the, the distribution of the post offices, when we've closed branches, we have been fortunate that there's been a, a post office very close by. And that's we feel that's, a, a, at the, this point in time, a better solution for our customers where that's available. But if we were looking at any locations where a post office wasn't available, then absolutely a mobile branch would be something we would consider along with other alternatives. But as I say, fortunately, where, we're, where we have chosen to close, we have either a, a, a Santander branch very close by or a post office, and we think that provides a good service for customers. Glasgow Bank uh, it constantly comes onto the agenda. We don't have any uh, mobile branches in... Uh, in foreseeable in the next year uh, because we've just had a look at it uh, we don't see it as an alternative we're only closing two branches this year uh, if our customers that's our customer demand and that's what our customer will certainly continuously look at that at TSB we don't have any as I've said earlier we've no branch closures planned for 2018 and 70% of our customers live within two miles of our branches so at the moment, it's, it's not something we're considering, but that's not to say in the future, if the situation's right, we would consider. Okay, thanks very much. The rest of my questions are going to be focused on Robin and Simon about the, the mobile branch network. Um, what criteria is used to decide where a mobile branch will stop and how frequently are those routes revised? We review, uh, we review our... Um, uh, the, the the routes each month. Uh, we've currently, at the moment, because there is obviously there are branches closing, um, we've said that we're not planning any changes between now and the end of the year to just let um, let the current routes um, bed in, if you like, and get and, and allow customers um, to be used used to using it, and also for us to, to assess what the demand is. Um, so, so they're reviewed monthly. In terms of the criteria, I mean, it's very flexible. So I was in, in on our mobile bank, which travels out of Ullapool. Um, we stop uh, at uh, an individual um, uh, small kind of collection of houses, which is sheltered housing, and there are three customers that we serve there, uh, and that's to their front door, as well as a petrol station up the road, which is on the way between two stops. So it's... It, depending on, on the route and our history in that local area, we try and accommodate as many customers as possible. So we look at, we look at very specific uh, customer needs. 
um, as well as looking at where is their broader demand. So where, for example, might we best place a stock that might have been between two other stops where we'd seen usage decline, and that might happen might happen to be a better stop. So we take into account a number of factors, but we also um, take individual representations from customers. And also, if we notice a customer that stopped coming to a branch, for example, um, in, a, in a more rural area, it might be that we, we could offer to sort of see if we could serve them in a different way. So lots of factors. For those three customers you referred to, how long would you actually stop at that location? It, would, it really only takes a few minutes for us to check they're okay and see if they've got any banking needs on that day. So it's right. literally a few minutes. It's not okay. too long. Robin? I, I think our, our approach is different. We are endeavouring, certainly with the, the new branches that are Equality Act uh, compliant, um, to, to provide a, a stable offering. Um, so we have a timetable, we have a set route, uh, we have set times, they are um, you know, one to two hours, as I said already, and we obviously endeavour uh, to commit to that. Um, they will be reviewed periodically, uh, generally looking for feedback from consumers, from customers, uh, where they feel that there's uh, any, any shortcoming in our service offering. But, but I think largely our mindset is to try and um, solidify around this offering. We have no intentions to change it or change it dramatically. Um, and the provision of mobile branches has largely been in response to uh, branch closures, uh, whilst also accepting that uh, we have uh, post offices in close proximity to the branches that we've closed. Um, I'm aware of the, the recent in introduction of mobile uh, branches in, in my constituency in Balerno, Curry, and Juniper Green. Initially, RBS said no. Um, and the reason you put them in is because Castle Community Bank have, have uh, <coughs> offered to put a mobile branch in, but initially for a year you said you wouldn't put them in. So um, they stop for 30 minutes at a time at each of the three locations. How many customers would you expect to serve in a 30 minute period, given that the Bank of Scotland stopped for between one and two hours at a particular spot? Well, when I was, I was, I was actually there in the last couple of weeks, and I think there was about 13 or 14 customers that, that, that had used the van on that particular day. That was in, in a half hour period in, in Juniper Green. Yeah. So now some of the customers, um, uh, you know, may have more complicated needs than, than others. So, um, uh, and some of them it's simply a, a, you know, jump on and do a basic transaction. So, um, I mean, the van stay, although it's a 30 minute slot, the van, you know, the mobile bank will stay there for as long as it's needed to make sure that we serve the customers. Mm, so we have some flexibility in the, in the timetable uh, to allow for that, because um, obviously any given week or, or month, there might be a different number of people that, that turn up for it. But I mean, we keep a, a constant watch on that and to make sure that we're staying for the right period of time or, you know, if it's not long enough, if it feels too compressed, then we might lengthen it or, if numbers aren't as uh, what we thought they would be, then we might well uh, choose to choose to decrease it or amalgamate some stops. I mean, the, re the reason for asking is um, one of the, the correspondence you had with Gene Freeman back in September 2017, you actually stated in a letter that where a service is consistently used by fewer than 10 customers, we will review the sustainability of the branch stop. Now, uh, I, I'm not sure what transaction would take less than three minutes per customer in order to serve that individual by the time they got on the van, deal, deal with their um, inquiry or their, cost, their transaction, whatever it happens to be, and get back off the vehicle again. Um, you know, how would you serve an individual in three minutes and are you really setting up these three stops to fail? Yeah, no, there, I mean, there's, so there's more than more than one person on the on on the mobile bank, I would there's say. There's two. There's so a driver and one person. No, they, but both will serve. So the, when I was on in Juniper Green there. last week, both were serving customers. Some of the transactions <coughs> did just take a couple of minutes. What I would say is, I mean, the mobile bank has been a provision and part of what how Royal Bank of Scotland has served its customers for 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 more than for 72 years. Okay, and the feedback from customers is that um, they like the they, they like the fact that it's reliable. It's a way. It's usually closer than their next, next nearest banking alternative, uh, and the feedback is great. The feedback on the colleagues who serve customers is is good, and so we we do our very best to make sure that we can accommodate you know any change in in demand. But we also make sure that we want to put those uh, mobile banks where they're going to be of the highest value to the most number of people. But accepting that. Sometimes we make accommodations for individual customers, as I said before. So, um, Moving on to the, the fleet itself, how many of the vehicles that you have have disabled access? 
So in 2015, we reviewed um, the, the, the mobile banks that, that we ran. Our customers, they used to have tailgate lifts. Mm -hmm. uh, our customers uh, told us they didn't like to use them. Um, so um, in response to that feedback, we tried to find different ways of serving customers. They were then removed. Um, we've now got the option of something called My Halo, which is a key fob for customers so we can come to them, serve them either from their car or from their home, for example. Um, so we don't have tailgate lifts on the, on the vans, but we've spoken to all 89 of the customers that we've um, identified that might have restricted access to a van to check are we meeting their needs in a way that's, come, that, that's right for them? We've not had any, any, any negative response to that. I think most people are, are happy with the way that it is. So um, we, we feel that we've you know, found a way of serving everybody uh, and making the right accommodations for everyone. Robin? Uh, our seven mm. new mobile branches are Equality Act compliant. The five existing ones are not currently, but they'll be replaced over the next three years with new mobile branches, and they will all be Equality Act compliant. Okay. Uh, so basically a question for RBS, Simon, is, um, you know, do you think that you actually contravened the Equality Act of 2010 by um, not making reasonable adjustments to make your vehicle accessible? Because, you know, there will be people from time to time who will want to bank who haven't made that special arrangement with you when you were talking about the FOBs, etc. And the adjustments that we've made to service, I think, uh, I think are right. Um, I think we are, you know, openly looking at whether there's anything else that we could do over and above what's already there. Um, but I don't have any further details on branch fleet design or anything at this mm -hmm. point. But we've spoken with the we've spoken with the um, uh, with the Equality and Human Rights Commission about this. Uh, we met with them very recently just to talk this through. Okay, thanks so much, Julian Martin. Thank you, convener. Good morning. Um, I'd like to turn to the Access to Banking Standard. Um, the Access to Banking Standard, of course, was written by banks and you self-police, I suppose, your uh, compliance to it. Uh, many of our witnesses over the period that we've been doing this inquiry said that you, the banks, fall short of some of it. And certainly there was a great deal of criticism that there was one element missing from that, and that is consultation prior to a decision to close. Um, I would like to ask the question about consultation prior to making a decision with your customers and the communities that you have branches are and ask you individually if you do that. So, um, under the access to banking standard, the consultation is where, you know, after we have made the decision, so we've yes. done, done the assessment, We've taken into account all the local factors, the access, etc., and then we go out and reach out to yeah. MSPs. With respect, I'm aware of that. What I'm asking is, do you consult prior to making a decision with your customers and the communities that you serve? We, we would consider local factors. We, we wouldn't hold a consultation, but we would have looked at local factors, we'd look at customer behaviour, We'd identify vulnerable customers that we were going to reach out to to ensure they had access to banking. The bank, certainly from a Clydesdale Bank perspective, we take into account all the factors of the community and the surrounding. But you don't customer. consult with them? We, we, would, we would have discussions with certain groups to understand what the banking needs. We look at economic data. And we look at data that be able to point us to those consultations. So we would have a good, inf good source of information that would be able to give us make a, an informed decision. So you do actually contact some of your customers before we you would, make a decision. We might take a we might take a sample of customers. Depends on the geography, and a sample of customers, and we might have a discussion with them. Not in all cases. We don't do formal consultation with customers before any closures. We are fully adhere to the access to banking standards, as, as you would expect. Um, but the other thing we do take into account in making our decisions is representations from our own local teams. So we do involve our local teams who, of course, speak to our customers every day. And they'll give us some sense of, of potential impacts on the community, which is absolutely factored into our decision making. But we don't formally consult now. 
and I would uh, echo that. So I think we take into account as many uh, possible factors uh, mm -hmm. as possible. Yeah. I understand what, that with respect, but, but you don't actually reach out to your customers before you make a decision. No, we do look in detail them. at what our customers do, so how they, where they go, how they bank, and what they're banking for. Uh, and we do engage with our local teams in terms of getting their perspective on, you know, a, an individual branch and an individual community. But there isn't a structured um, customer consultation. Not, not even with your, your your business clients, not even with the the businesses in the local community that bank with you. You don't reach out to them. Uh, there is no, there, there is no, there is no, there is no structured customer consultation in no. terms of that that discussion. But we do look at what our customers actually do, where they bank, and how they bank before we take any decision, and then engage the people that support our customers directly on a day-to-day -day basis uh, before any decision is made. Uh, we don't consult formally, as has been said already. It's not a requirement of the standard. We do absolutely use local management uh, and get their input into the thought processes that go into a branch closure. Some of the things that I am most concerned about are providing certainty to customers and also colleagues. Uh, and I would be concerned with a pre-consultation uh, creating a degree, quite a high degree of uncertainty for customers and colleagues about the possible outcome. Yet a decision made without consultation, by the very, the very nature, provides a degree of uncertainty, but given that you have spoken to us today and said um, that once decisions are made, and I can't remember which one of my colleagues it was in response to, I think it might have been uh, Gordon MacDonald, that there are no instances where a decision has been overturned as a result of post-decision consultation. So my, and obviously, your reputation, Royal Bank's reputation at the moment, as a result of your decision to close many banks, many of them being the last bank in town, some of them being the last bank on an island, um, is, is, is massive. Would it not be the case that a pre-consultation prior to making a decision would be a good reputational exercise for banks and might stem some calls for the access to ban banking standard to be reviewed or the fact that you're self-policing to be reviewed as an option? I would say on the issue of consultation, I think we, I think when Professor Griggs gave evidence to this, you know, to this committee, it is, I think, difficult to know where that would start and stop. So I think that there is an I a practical issue with that. But I also think that the, the approach we take to look at what customers are actually doing, you know, how are they, you know, how can we best support them and what alternatives are available is a, you know, a sound basis on which we try and, we try and take this, you know, it, there's no one determining factor. So there's many, we take in as many factors as we possibly can. Um, so I think, you know, the way that we all go about it at the moment is obviously, as you've heard, very, very similar. Uh, and uh, as, as I say, I don't think, I yeah. think it's very difficult to see how Yet, the consultation reaches this a morning, different or better decision. This morning, we've heard from, from Jackie Bailey's two towns that have been left without the banking access that was promised. Therefore, I would put to all of you that the access to banking standard has not been adhered to and is possibly not fit for purpose. Do you not run the risk that if you can't self-place yourself, that you're looking to a situation where steps might have to be taken that someone else, some other body, reviews the banking standard and pleases it. We all agree about the, the lending standards boards, and I know, know certainly they've been in to review our adherence to the uh, access to banking standards this year. So we, we take it very seriously. And I think, you know, we're also always looking for opportunities to improve. We've had some feedback on some of the language used in our impact assessments could be clearer. We'll take that on board. In the last round of impact assessments, we also made sure we gave higher focus to the post office and, and giving that information to our customers. So we do, we do take the feedback on board, and, and I expect that we'll all continue to work to improve what we provide under the access to banking standards. Will you be taking the feedback from this inquiry and the witnesses who've said that the banking standards should have an obligation to consult pre-decision? I think as Susan said, we've had feedback from the Lending Standards Board. I mean, we are, I think we are learning 
you know, all the time from, you know, the feedback that we get from multiple sources, this committee included from the Lending Standards Board, from our individual customers, from elected representatives. Um, so I think, you know, all of that we take into account to try and make sure that what is a very difficult decision and a very difficult process becomes less difficult for everyone involved uh, on the uh, in for our communities and customers, uh, you know, when we're looking at it. And so I, I fully accept any, any feedback or any uh, input into how we can do things better from any source. Uh, you know, I would say we, we obviously once we've made a, the difficult decision to close a branch, we provide the information to our customers. We do all of the things that the access to banking standard requires. And you know, one of the interesting things is talking to our customers on the ground when we made the decisions. And for, for most of the customers, the biggest issue that they raise with us actually is what's going to happen to the branch staff. So there's a huge loyalty, as you've already indicated, the branch staff are really important in the local community. And that's why we work very hard to move those colleagues to other local branches where they are a friendly face for the for the customers when they come in to see, see them. Very important. I don't, I don't think any of us take this lightly at all. I think that's been clear today. And it is very local and a lot of the hard work. What, once we've made that decision, and, and you could say we haven't reversed it because the correct decision was made, but the work we undertake afterwards and engaging in that local community is immense, both to make sure partners are looked after and again we, we haven't had compulsory redundancies and partners have been able to welcome the customers in their nearest branch or help them with the post office so I, I think we are committed to continue doing that so in a case where you have been found to fall short of the access to banking standard and again I come back to some of the examples that have been given by my colleagues today where I would say that it, that's been the case what recourse is there for the customer? I mean, what, what can they possibly do? Who could they go to if you're all self-policing to actually complain that they haven't been given access to banking that they require for the community's local needs? I'm particularly mindful of a situation in my constituency where we have a lot of farmers and farmers deal with cheques um, a lot because in vast sums of money where they've been to the mart and they have um, they will be given a cheque at the end of the day but they don't have ready access to the facilities to cash that cheque and that's something that was not taken into consideration for example um, when, when banks are, are closing um, for example, the Clydesdale Bank closed in Mint Law and me and a local councillor had to fight to get an ATM. That wasn't taken into consideration when you closed that bank. That took me and another elected representative to act on behalf of the community. So I would say that some of the access to banking standards uh, <coughs> obligations are not been held. So what recourse is there for a community when you fall short of that? I have to say we would never knowingly breach any of the access to banking standards and we expend a huge amount of effort uh, with a specialist team to make sure that we have fulfilled all the obligations within the standard. But any customer um, can complain to us, that any customer can make representation to us and we will always consider that representation. And for customers where we have closed branches, we are more than happy to discuss with them all the alternatives that we believe are available to help support them, whether they are personal or business customers. So we, we can certainly say that the Lending Standards Board is something that we as organisations, as banks, take incredibly seriously. And we, hold, we do hold ourselves accountable. Our representative boards hold us accountable as seniors and as executives of the bank that we do make sure that we adhere to that. If we as an organisation do fall short in an area, in an isolated area, we should be correcting that. And we, and, and we, and we, and we, are, we have more than just our moral compass to that. We have the fact that we as an organisation that has been supported by these communities for a long time. So we certainly will. And if we do have those cases, and I'm, I'm pleased that you did call out the, the issue of the ATM. Because if we, if we do fall short, we'd like to see how we can bridge that gap. 
because these customers are equally important to us as a bank as that of the constituents. Yeah. I suppose what I was doing with that example was calling out where your post-decision consultation had not worked for that community and it took two elected individuals to make representation on behalf of that community. So I guess, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to hand over to my colleagues now, but I guess what I'm saying is if it's not, it's not effective in all cases and that possibly your access to banking standards needs to be looked at again. Do, do you agree with that proposition that it may need to be looked at again, the access to banking standards? I think we see the access to banking standards as a baseline that we want to adhere to and uh, we welcome feedback, we welcome feedback as such as today to help us to go back and review and consider. Um, we also welcome feedback from the lending standards boards and, and I'm sure that over the next few years we'll continue to refine and improve based on the feedback from our customers and uh, other stakeholders. Come to Kezia Dugdale. Thanks, Convener. Um, I think it's fair to say that uh, as a public relations exercise, the last few months haven't been particularly pretty for the banks when it comes to closures. Can I ask you whether you think um, the media have over-egged the level of um, public anger or whether that public anger is real? I think we all understand that any branch closure has a, uh, an impact and it's, it, it you know, can create challenges for many of our customers, which I hope you've heard today. We we take very seriously and work really hard to try to mitigate that. Um, so I think when we read, whether it's a, a complaint from a customer or a representation in, in the media or through another stakeholder, we take it really seriously. So um, I, I wouldn't sit here and say that the media have, have overrided it. I think every complaint deserves to be taken seriously. Every impact deserves to be considered seriously. And that's exactly what we do. Anybody else? I'm sure that view, we, we take uh, representation from any source very seriously, um, uh, not least the media and also politicians as well as our customers. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we seek to learn from it. Would you also say that perhaps the, the, the kind of programme of bank closures is now coming to an end, that um, you've all collectively had a rationalisation of your branches and we're in the end game phase here? And if so, what lessons have you learned from the whole experience? What would you maybe not repeat if you had a chance to do this again? If I could comment on that, I would say we, we've made the, the commitment not to review any branches in Scotland until at least 2020. Now... What I would say is, previous to the round of closures that, that are currently uh, that we're currently uh, are out and proposed, it was a very unfortunate set of circumstances where almost banks were trying to keep up with the pace of change, and a branch would close, a customer would be directed to another branch, only to find out that in a period of time that branch is also closing. So I think what we've tried to do is to give people certainty, to give colleagues certainty, to give customers certainty and give communities certainty about the shape, about where branches are, but also what the alternatives, um, the banking provision. So as I said before, because branch usage is halved, but the points, of, the points of presence, the places you can bank have tripled. So that's a big adjustment for people to, you know, to get to grips with um, because banking will feel, already feels very different. And so I think there's a while that, that we're going to have to, that that's going to have to, if you like, bed in for a bit. I think we're going to have to support, continue to support customers and communities to get used to the differences that are taking place, technology or otherwise. more branches earlier, is that your reflection? No, I think, no, I think that there are, I think it was, it was really unfortunate that customers were um, put from one branch to a, a branch that, that later closed. I'm not quite sure... I don't have the, the silver bullet answer to how that could have been done differently, but I do appreciate the uncertainty and the pain that that did cause a number of customers, and we would never wish to repeat that. But I think, you know, certainly where we are now, uh, our view is that, you know, we are fixed until at least 2020, but the world is continuing to change at a very fast pace, but we think that we've got, we're striking the right balance of all the alternative ways to bank for people. Can I ask your colleagues to comment on that? I think it's important to hear from everybody as to whether or not you think you're at the end of your branch closure programmes. So to your, to your first question, I think the, the important part is the rate of change is is continuing at a faster rate. And technology is changing even more rapidly and will continuously to double to that what it's doing at the moment. And it's changing at a faster rate than the human being. So what can we do more of would be the, my answer. And that would be saying, talking to that of customer engagement in terms of education and helping to understand how technology can help and make life easier 
for us to be able to bank. Because banking is actually becoming simpler to many people and a lot easier. And certainly the new generation is asking for that. There's a split between the generations of people. I could ask you specifically on the point about whether your bank is at the end of its closures programme. The banks, a bank will never commit to that because customers' demand will detect that. Ask your colleagues the same question, because I do have a few I want to get through here. I, I want to hear from everybody. Are you at the end of your, your closure programmes? For, for TSB, we will continue to be led by the change in customer behaviour, customer demand, and we, we won't force or aggressively pace that change. We will follow the customer change. Dare, um, we, absolutely, we follow what our customers are, are doing and we look at the patterns of usage and what they demand from us and also the other areas that they want us to invest. So we will continue to respond to what the information on our customers' usage tells us. And Bank of Scotland? Same view, which okay. is society is changing, our customers are changing and we'll continue to review our proposition for our customers in light of societal and consumer changes. That, that's really helpful. So we've had references to customer patterns, technology change, society's changing, which really takes us back to the changing nature of cash. We've heard this week that people are more likely to use their debit cards than they are to use cash. And we've also heard that there's going to be a programme of ATM closure. So can you tell us about your plans to close ATMs across your banks? No plans to close ATMs. There, are, there have been consequential ATM reductions on the back of branch closures. We have 7% um, of the total ATM estate in Scotland within Bank of Scotland, and uh, we have no specific plans to close ATMs. We are not working on any plans to close ATMs either. No, we do we sometimes lose ATMs when a branch is closed, but we'll always make care, take care to make sure there's a link free to use ATM nearby or the post office, and we're um, a very supportive of Link and the Financial Inclusion Programme. No, ATMs. There's in fact the capability is being enhanced that what you can do through ATMs. So we would encourage customers to be using more of the ATMs, and that's why we've got things called DTMs, which is deposit taking, where you can break your deposits, you can do a lot more banking through that, and that can be able to out of convenience of ours, so it's a capability, core capability and part of the omni-channel for the bank. Is that specifically an answer to say you have no plans to close ATMs We've at got no scale? Immediate, no immediate plans. We will, however, as, as customer demand in certain areas, we'll build out ATMs, and we'll, and we'll, and we'll, we'll do away with ATMs as they're required but we don't have immediate plans. We have, we have no plans in place for ATMs. Thank you, that's helpful, because of course Link do, and they're predicting up to 300 free to uh, access bank machines going from July uh, onwards. Link have a rule in place that no one ATM can disappear if it's more than a kilometre from the neighbouring one. Is that a rule that you could perhaps adopt now uh, if you were to start closing ATMs so that you can learn some of the mistakes from the bank closure programme? made that commitment as part of our branch closure programme that if uh, there is not a free to use cash machine within one kilometre, if one is being removed as a result of a branch closure, then we will make sure that one is left within that community. So I think we've been clear on that commitment. Yeah, and we are part of, AC, of the Link scheme. Okay. like to hear from all of them. We are members of Link and we, are, we, we support the principles that have been uh, proposed. Okay. And from the final two? Yeah. And, yeah. and any of our branch closures in all of them there has been a free to use ATM available to the customers. That's me convenient. Thank you. Fulton McGregor. Hey, thanks, good, hey, good morning panel. Um, some of the people we've had in front of us uh, given evidence and people that come and speak to us as, as MSPs just don't trust digital uh, technology which is where I feel that you know the closures uh, are coming from. What, what are you doing to uh, alleviate those concerns for consumers? A huge amount we can do about education. First of all, digital technology is not for everybody, and we have to acknowledge and understand that and provide services in different ways, which we which we do. Um, but there is a, a, a role for us, I think, in helping to educate and um, help people feel comfortable how to use digital safely. So, as an example, we've run some scam avoidance schools across the UK, which are talking not just about uh, banking digitally, but use of digital more generally. And um, in just in recent months, we had over a thousand uh, people, customers from uh, customers and non-customers from across Scotland, attend 94 of those events. And we think that's a really important role we can play in helping to educate, not just for digital banking, as I've said, but safe use of digital 
more generally, as well as also educating customers on the services that are available. So for any of our customers, they can come into any of our branches, sit down, we'll work with them on a one-to-one -one basis to help them. We'll spend as much time as they need to get comfortable with using digital if that's something that they're keen to do. Yeah. Anybody else? If I could just add to that. So we made a, a commitment to have a, a technical expert uh, trained in, in every branch. We've also the community bankers that now operate across um, 69 different markets are also qualified as uh, technical experts and we've made a commitment to um, train and work support 1 million customers at a bank wide level in Friends Against Scams as well just to build people's confidence in using the technology but keeping themselves safe and secure at the same time. It is a really important issue. Um, we've heard about the pace of change so absolutely we take very seriously the need to ensure that people are confident and capable in how they're using that technology so that we try and break down some of the the, the, the appeared barriers to, to people taking advantage of it. I'm glad you brought up the community banker. I met the community banker that's now in place for the, the steps area, which is um, which is one of the banks to close. Actually, tomorrow it closes its door. Um, <laughs> and I was very impressed, I have to say. I think that um, she's she's very keen to help. But, but what strikes me is why would the community banker not be put in place before bank closures? If, that, if this is how you feel it's going, that, that you know that people are needing to move to digital services, but you accept, I think that everybody's accepted that there's a large proportion of the population that aren't ready to do that for a number of different reasons that have already been discussed. Why would it not make more sense to put these people in place way before any bank closure, rather than now a very capable and, and energetic community banker coming in a few days before closure? In, in some cases, the community bankers were in, in place before closures, not, not in all, and sometimes that was just us finding the right person to, to do that role. So I would accept that the earlier is, is definitely better. Um, one of the reasons that we go, uh, you know, give six months notice rather than just three is to give a longer period of time so that we can get everything in place, um, uh, including the community banker where that's the right uh, where that's the right role for us uh, in that area. But I would accept that sooner is, is definitely better than, than better than later. Has MD else got uh, any services like that, community banking? Uh, as part of our Helping Britain Prosper commitment, we've got 20,000 colleagues. We call them digital champions, but they're, they're skilled to quite a high level around using on our online banking. And we, uh, we have an aim to support 2 million people in the UK with digital skills. Elements of that are about protecting them from scamming and information that banks will never ask for and just making sure they understand that. Uh, so we've, we've got 1.8 million still to do with the 2 million over the next three years. In a similar way, we have what we call digital wizards in all our branches. And if it was a branch that was closing months before, we do digital classes with customers to help them. We have Wi-Fi and iPads in all the branches. We follow the Take 5 Fraud Awareness, so we're out in local communities supporting that, and our partners do a fantastic job working with vulnerable customers to help them with that. Similar to the other banks, with the addition that we also have a telephone banking post the closures, post any uh, uh, change, even a normal customer that migrates can pick up the phone and get some help. There's uncertainty in terms of security, they can phone in at any time. Just one thing around, uh, <laughs> time, but uh, telephone banking, we are going to be introducing this year what we call voice biometrics, which is basically people using their own voice, and I think that will ease the access to telephone banking for a lot of customers over time. Okay, so uh, is there not uh, would there not have been a possibility for many of the banks, in the the buildings that are left, for instance, the the steps one that I've already mentioned, would it not have been uh, possible for consideration to be given for that being a, a service hub for some of these services that you're talking about? Because it seems like there still would be a need there. And then you'd almost have a transition. So you would go from um, a decision that a bank would close because of customer footfall, which I don't necessarily agree with because any branch that I've been in that's been closing is always at a high footfall, but I'm sure you've got your, your stats for that. Um, then, you, then you would move into a second phase, which would be how often would that building be used for those services that you've discussed? And then at that point, if the community weren't actually using it for those services or had moved on to another form of banking, then you would have a, you'd have a means to say, well, actually, this is justified closure. It just seems to be, in some communities, banks there, 
closed going. That's what it seems to me. It's disappointing to hear that customers feel the experience that today we're here, tomorrow we're gone in a, bank, in a bank closure. And why I say that is because there's a number of not only the education that goes and alternative channels that are offered, but also there's that early stage notification that the customers are all notified well in advance. And if we as a bank are not doing that adequately and we're not communicating sufficiently, then then it's then it's a lesson to be learnt and to make sure. So yes, there is a bit of a migration process, but us as human beings often sort of leave it till the last minute and don't believe it until reality comes. And and maybe that's something that we could learn from and do better. Uh, so I take that as feedback. Uh, but having said that, we do notify our customers well in advance and we have our relationship managers on the ground, specifically with our small business and with our medium business customers, in engaging with them. And then as they come into the branch, posters are put up and there's a notification. So it shouldn't feel that. From I don't think it's, there's any issue with your communication. Okay. Um, I think that this about, it goes back to earlier points that colleagues raised, it's about what... Um, the community can do about that. Because I think that all of you have said, apart from one example, I heard that once the decision's made, the closures have went have went through. So the communication is fine. I think I've known about the steps closure for some time uh, and other ones as well. But it's then the community feels stuck in, in what they can do in terms of representation. But um, I'm happy to leave it there, convener. All right, thank you. Dean Lockhart. Thank you very much, Convener. Uh, good morning to the panel. I'd like to come back to the idea that um, a post office can act as a direct replacement to, to a bank which has closed. We've heard in other evidence that there are limitations to what a post office can uh, deliver. Sometimes it's in a busy shop, sometimes the staff are not fully trained, they don't offer mortgages and loans. So can I ask each bank what um, level of investment and other steps are you taking to upskill the post office network and make sure that uh, in many cases they can actually act as a direct replacement to a bank that has closed? So I think as I, as I said earlier, certainly from the Royal Bank's perspective, not only are we working with post office teams in terms of understanding who the customers might be on an individual branch by branch basis, but we're also uh, supporting them with additional equipment so that the banking experience becomes one that's maybe more familiar or smoother for a number of customers. And over above that, on, on the point about guidance, we're also now um, working with um, specific post office teams to train them again in the, in the Friends Against Scams so that our customers uh, are getting... Um, the right information about keeping themselves safe and secure, as well as um, you know all of the basic everyday banking needs that we would aim to we would aim to meet. So that's what we're doing in addition to the the minimum contract. I would say. Yeah, so working very closely with the local post offices. So, so as soon as an, 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 any announcement of a closure, we'll work with the local post office in terms of services and look at what our customers need and whether that. Uh, post office is in a position to provide that support. I do think, and um, some of our branch teams do this exceptionally well, uh, I do think we can do more to work with the post office in terms of training and upskilling, and we certainly see that as something that we can do more of over, over the coming period. But I've got lots of great examples in Lithgow and in Lockerbie of the local postmasters coming into the branches, working with our branch teams, so that when we're actually talking to customers about the changes, we're, sh we're showing up as a united team and making that transition hopefully as seamless as possible for our customers. But I think I, I would acknowledge that we can continue to do do more and to work even more closely with the post office. It's a comprehensive plan uh, that is drawn up with UK Finance, and as we continue to be able to renew and work on that, there's a journey still to be gone. But we've got to acknowledge that there's certain capabilities that the post office certainly will not will not provide, and that is where the bank will fill that. And hence, to the point of mortgages, we have mortgages visors that are out on the road. We also have the telephone banking, we have those capabilities over and above the digital, where people don't feel digitally and maybe don't have coverage in terms of 3G or Wi-Fi coverage in certain geography, because that is a challenge that we're also facing too. So we have to have phone banking and so forth to be able to substitute that. I think post offices support ourselves and the customers very well, and they're a trusted outlet in the local communities, which is great to have. I think there is still more we can do with our customers and the post offices to help that relationship when branches are pulling out. Um, with regard to the advice, we are still investing in branches and with 70% of the customers living within two miles of our branches, we can provide that face-to-face -face advice when they need it as well, which we're committed to doing. 
Uh, we've been working uh, with the other banks and also with the Treasury around uh, promoting the post office service more, so more literature, uh, more education in branch, as the others have said already. At a local level, the local teams work with the local post office on making sure they are in a position to take over the customers. And as far as the adv advice related products such as mortgages and in some of the other uh, core banking, then we continue to have the largest branch network in Scotland and we believe we will continue to have that for some time, um, possibly forever. Uh, and actually, over and above that, the um, ability for our customers to access advice over the phone and also through video capability is expanding all the time. So we believe the, the different mechanisms are there to support our customers. Thank you very much. If I could follow up on a slightly different question. Change has come up as, as uh, clearly a constant here in the sense of the underlying driver of, of a lot of this. And um, the banks don't seem to coordinate for obvious reasons in terms of legal regulatory reasons why you can't talk to each other about closing branches. But is there any scope for industry or sector coordination? If, if change is ongoing and banks only look at their own P&L in terms of what to do, there might end up being branch and ATM deserts. Uh, uh, across the country if there's not some level of coordination. So I just wanted to get, not specifics, but some thoughts about how the sector could coordinate and talk to each other going forward. I, I think we're mindful of competition. I'm, I'm not entirely clear that the complete barrier to some form of dialogue is, is competition concerns, legal, legal concerns. Um, but we are, we are competing when we are a commercial entity and we wish to be successful in our, in our own right and um, uh, here for the long run. Um, we, we believe, as I'm sure others do, that branches continue to be a very important part of our proposition. Uh, but we are, we are certainly open to any suggestions about how we could overall uh, improve the quality of service that we give to our customers, uh, irrespective of, of channel. Um, so we, we, we'd be happy to consider any proposals, but I, I, I suspect competition law is, is not a barrier to that. I think we've, we've signed up, to, for example, to the digital charter, and that's something that I think all banks are participating in. So there are areas of specific cooperation where we can meet on a common agenda, be it on the digital charter, where there are aspects where we can cooperate and put the competition and commercial um, <coughs> considerations behind us in a neutral context and look at it like that. I think that's something I know is planned and I think that's, you know, they're the type of things I think, you know, obviously we would be keen to do, to do more of. I mean, I would agree. I think we all, we're all very mindful of competition um, constraints, but also what do seek to work together where it is appropriate. And I think, you know, Link is another example where we come together to make sure we're supporting it in terms of financial inclusion, um, and as well as the work we're doing with UKFI on promoting the services at the post office and making those yeah, even more even more supportive for our customers. I can only agree with uh, what the uh, board has spoken. I think uh, there is, however, to say from a regulatory perspective, there are areas within which we can have conversations and we can discuss. The commercials behind that, we have different competitive edges and different way of markets that we play within. So there is room and there are dialogue and we do use those forums that we do have it in place. There could be areas where we could uh, develop that even further and be very keen to hear about those on the feedback. Yep. I think based on the discussions today, there's definite topics where it would be helpful for us to work collaboratively together. That, thanks very much. I think that would be one uh, area going forward that we would love welcome your feedback on. So thank you. Thanks very much. And perhaps a final follow-up from Gillian Martin. Thank you very much, convener. I just want to follow on from the line of question that Fulton McGregor was around confidence in online banking being a barrier to a lot of people. Um, and I think it would be remiss for us to <clears throat> not um, mention the fact that we did have a situation with the TSB where the online banking was not available to people. And as a result of the issue with your IT system, you've had quite a lot of phishing scams. Now, obviously, I don't want to add to that nervousness, but the fact remains a lot of people were subject to some fraudulent activity as a result of this. I'd like to give you the opportunity to tell me what you've learned from that and to give people confidence that they can trust to online banking and that maybe others would like to pitch in about what they've done, maybe learned from the situation that TSB had um, that added to that nervousness that, that Fulton McGregor has mentioned. Yep. I think um, when a bank goes through any major IT change, we're always um, at higher risk of fraudulent activity and that's exactly what we saw. 
and we reacted very quickly to that and were extremely sorry to customers for the inconvenience they had and extremely grateful for the amazing partners we have in branches that reacted so well. I think what we've learned from that, and we will continue to learn through this, is that at times like that, where people have depended on mobile, they then revert back to branch either through necessity or they find comfort in that face-to-face -face situation. And fortunately, we have been able to meet that, that need for the customer. We've had to respond quickly because it was at such a scale and it probably resulted in customers' accounts being blocked more than they would have been blocked, but it was a safeguard. What we have seen is our digital and mobile return now to pre-migration levels, so customers can have that confidence. We partnered with fraud awareness firms, um, telephony firms, and we put out messages both in national newspapers, on our intranet, etc., to raise awareness to the public. Um, we, we do have the thumbprint and iris recognition, so that helps with the safety of that. But I think in all of this, we, we have learned the importance of multi-channels responding quickly and not, not being complacent with the fraud piece mentioned there and there's been a lesson for other banks as well that when those systems did fail people turned to their branch for accessing cash for giving that, that that security aspect of things we have a situation where the trajectory is that branches are closing what fail safe what, what backup is there should anything like happen and IT problems do happen um, and will happen so I would like to throw that open to the other, other banks particularly the Royal Bank who's you, you've, you've had so many closures. What 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 backstop is there for people? Like, should your IT systems fail and they can't access any cash? So I think we had a um, you know a significant um, you know uh, uh, computer issue in 2012, which impacted our customers. Uh, a lot has changed in the organisation since then. But in terms of how customers would respond today and how it would be different to then. As I say, the, the physical kind of points of presence have tripled in the last five years. Okay, so the ability for people to access a place where they can go and do their everyday banking has gone up by a factor by by by, by three times since that happened. So there's more flexibility and there's more ways of doing your banking today than there were then. So I think you know yes, you know there's been an outage, and I think when. You know, when there's an outage, uh, a, a problem such as the one that TSB experienced, I think we all feel that. Uh, and so nobody wins in that situation. So the job is to make sure that our customers, all of our customers, are confident and capable in understanding how they can continue to do their everyday banking. And as I say, there are more options today than there were um, five years ago. Many, many more options. Do, do you agree then that we will all, always need cash? Because, I mean, probably like most people or many people. Um, when I grew up, there was no internet, but I now do internet banking, but also use cash. But the problem is when the internet banking fails or an individual can't operate it for whatever reason, um, we all have to fall back on cash. So do you agree that there must be always a provision for that um, on whatever basis so that people are not left in the position that they, they simply can't uh, buy things? I believe that is the case. Yes, I, 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 it's not our intention to uh, not provide access to cash for our customers as a result of branch closures. And I, I'm, you, you'll have heard a million statistics about what's happening to cash. There's definitely less usage of cash for payments, and that, that's projected to that reduction is project, projected to increase. But I think for as long a period of time as anybody in this room is going to be concerned about it, uh, cash will be a part of society. That is a really important part of our proposition as well. So, so while we have all of us made some changes, I would certainly say from our perspective that branches remain a really important part of our proposition. We have invested in telephone banking, we have invested in video, but actually there are times when people want to see somebody face to face and, and we recognise that. And do the rest of you agree with the proposition that we will always need cash? Sorry again. For the, yeah, certainly for the time frame that, 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 that I can foresee, I think that is, that is true. It is also true that you know, 7 out of 10 people regard the bank as something they carry around in their pocket today. That is only going to increase, uh, but I do think that cash is always going to be uh, an important backstop, uh, at least for the, you know, for the medium term. 
Jakesh is a very, a very important question because there are areas within banking that are becoming cashless. And that's why you have to transact digitally. They simply will not accept cash. But to your question, will cash be required? So if you, for example, shopped online or you went to Amazon, whatever, you have to, you cannot do it, or you have to do it other than paying it via digitally. But there will be an element that will always be there that will require cash. And for the foreseeable future, there will be. But that will change and it will start to migrate even more to a cashless environment. And it won't be just to a tap and go. It will move on to the mobile hands-free, which is that's where it is. Yeah, I, I agree that cash will be around. But I think as well, we still have to be mindful of the pace of change and how customers' behaviour change. And we, we must follow that as well. All right, well, thank you very much to all of you for coming in today. I'll suspend the meeting and we'll move to private session.